In this video, I will be performing the Invention in C minor by Johann Sebastian Bach and will also discuss how to approach it in terms of interpretation. Since I think it is better to be familiar with the piece or at least have listened to it before we discuss aspects of interpretation, this video will be structured as follows. First, you will see me performing the piece. Then we'll look at the form and discuss interpretation. And finally, you will hear my performance one more time, but this time accompanied by the score. The first issue to discuss is the choice of instrument. As you just saw, I performed the piece with each hand playing on a different manual. Based on the musical content, I think Bach wrote this invention with a two-manual harpsichord in mind. This is not because the left hand crosses over the right hand, but rather that in a couple of instances, the musical lines overlap in such a way that they cannot be played properly on an instrument without two manuals. Let me show you what I mean, and specifically what I have in mind are measures 13 and 18. So let's start with measure 13, where what we have here is we have an E flat in the right hand, and then at the same time we have to do a trill beginning on E flat in the left hand. So if I play a little from the beginning of that measure, um, what I'm thinking of happens on the third beat. Um, this is what happens. So this... Where you, you definitely need two manuals to really do this. You can fake it, of course, but you can't really do it the way it's written. The other instance I have in mind is in measure 18, and what we have here is the two hands crossing over, but that's not really the problem here. The problem is the phrasing. So if I can play this a little more slowly, it goes something like this. So 
So the issue here is that the way I want to phrase it, and we'll talk more about phrasing later, um, I want to do this kind of thing. And with the left hand, so that the, the final effect is something like this. Now, with one manual, I simply cannot do this. I, I have to play everything a little more detached so that it will work. So. It's not the same kind of effect, and to me, the kind of phrasing that I want to do is simply not possible if I don't have two manuals. As always, I'm not suggesting this piece should not be played on other instruments, but I think that understanding the capabilities of the instrument a composer had in mind can help a performer play the piece in a more convincing and engaging manner even if they decide to play it on a different instrument. Another aspect of the piece that benefits from having a two-manual harpsichord is its canonic structure. All 15 of the inventions have a two-voice contrapuntal texture, and usually we get a type of fugal writing where the opening theme, or subject, is imitated between the two voices but the C minor invention goes beyond a simple imitation of a theme, since it involves imitating an entire musical line. This may not be immediately apparent to someone listening or perhaps even sight-reading the piece for the first time. Bach appears to provide indications that this will be yet another example of fugal writing. Thus, the piece commences with a subject, and after its statement, the upper line continues with a simpler idea that resembles a counter subject, while the left hand begins by imitating the initial subject. It is only as the piece progresses that we realize that the imitation extends beyond the subject. Let me show you again what I mean. This is the beginning of the subject. Here's where the left hand would come in. And this is the simpler motive I talked about. And I went a little further because I wanted you to hear exactly what the right hand is doing. And what you will see is that the left hand, of course, being uh, a canon with the right hand, is doing the exact same thing. So when we start, so we go beyond simply imitating a subject. The canonic writing is not maintained throughout, so after several measures there is a switch to a more freely imitative writing. But Bach also uses this canonic texture to highlight the harmonic and formal structure of the piece. Formally, the piece is in rounded binary form with a corresponding harmonic trajectory from the tonic C minor of the first section to the minor dominant of G in the second section, returning back to C minor with the reappearance of the opening theme five measures before the end. And just as the first section starts with a canon before the pattern breaks off, the second section also starts with a canon using the same subject, but now stated in G minor with the left hand starting it this time. This is, by the way, in measure 11, and I will show you what I mean. So if you go to measure 11, we have this opening idea now transposed into G minor, and we start with the left hand.
and then the right hand is going to come a little later and do the same thing. So again, we have another canon, this time in G minor. When the subject returns in the tonic, five measures before the end, we don't really have enough time for yet another canon. So the two hands basically exchange their musical lines. And I think that for this type of canonic writing, a two manual harpsichord is an ideal instrument because each manual has its own distinctive timbre and thus the two musical lines, which are so similar to each other, are perceived as distinct entities in a clearer way. Now onto the interpretation of this invention. A very crucial aspect, as always, is phrasing. I've mentioned in previous videos that one of the fundamental differences between the performing aesthetic during Bach's time and the traditional modern performing practice has to do with a radically different approach to phrasing. The modern approach is to think in terms of long uninterrupted phrases or long legato lines. However, this approach is completely at odds with the Baroque aesthetic in which music consists of a series of short phrases or even better said, gestures. Thinking in gestures is crucial in this piece right from the very beginning as the opening theme basically consists of a long series of 16th notes which we have to make sure we can differentiate in various ways so that they can become expressive gestures rather than one long and differentiated line. The opening theme starts on the second half of the first beat. In other words, the first beat consists of an eighth note rest, followed by two sixteenth notes. The first thing I try to do is to make this audible. It's hard to put this into words, but when I start the piece, I actually mentally start with the eighth note rest and consciously take a breath for its duration. Then I play the two sixteenth notes with as little emphasis as possible because I'm treating them as leading to the first note of the second beat, which is more important in this context. So the first emphasis the listener will hear is the first note of the second beat. Let me show you what I mean. Um, if you listen to certain recordings, uh, you will hear something that resembles a little more this, In other words, the way the piece starts, we think, well, maybe this is the, the beginning of the first beat. What I try to do is to really mentally think about this rest as I start playing. So I start playing with the rest in my mind, I take a breath, and then I'm going to play the first two sixteenth notes fairly short so that it sounds something like this. So in other words, I, I try to make sure that I'm, I'm taking a breath and I'm leading on to the second beat, the first note of the second beat, so that the listener knows that there was a rest that preceded those two notes. Let's look at some of the gestures in the opening theme. The majority of them seem to occupy one full beat and many of them are some sort of stepwise ascending or descending motion. In these cases, I tend to give more importance to the first note, and I can do this by either lingering a little longer on that first note, or hold it longer and let it carry over into the second note. Think of it as a kind of finger pedaling. And what this does is to create more resonance, since there is more than one note sounding at the same time, and I progressively let go of the remaining notes a little faster 
to create a slight tapering off in terms of dynamics as I get towards the end of the beat. Let me show you again what I mean. Um, you probably noticed already when I played the beginning of the second beat, I did something like this. And again, notice how my hand is going to linger onto that first note, but I'm also going to take a little more time when I play it. I, I don't want to go to the next note as quickly. So, And then the next one, which is these four notes, this is a wonderful opportunity to do something like this. And you create this kind of tapering effect for the next beat. I use both of these effects, in other words, holding the note down longer and also lingering on it, on the first beat of the second measure, where we get a large leap of a diminished seventh. This is an expressive gesture that stands out in this theme, and I think Bach emphasizes its importance by placing it on the first beat. So, I would do it like this. Finally, there is a two-note oscillation, and my suggestion here would be to separate the two statements of it. Additionally, I'm going to linger a little bit more on the first note so that the effect is almost like not in a gun. And this is this gesture. It comes at the, at the end of the second measure before the trill. So this. So what I try to do is I try to keep this note a little longer. So it almost creates this, this slight effect of not in a gal. Now, one of the reasons to do this, to, in other words, to make this gesture so different, is that this type of two-note gesture appears throughout the piece in different guises. For example, um, let me find one instance. Um, if we go to measure Eight, for instance, we have something like this. So it's changed a little bit, but it's still this kind of two-note gesture. And you can almost think of this idea as a sighing motif. Sometimes a two-note gesture is juxtaposed with a stepwise four-note gesture. So there can be two different articulations going on at the same time, which can be very, very effective. And actually, if we stay at that measure eight that it was before, the right hand is doing this. And the left hand is doing this. So I will keep my initial idea of lingering to the first note and, and kind of tapering off when I have these these four note phrases in the left hand, and then I will do this in the right hand so that the final effect is something like this. Sorry, I missed the trill, but I hope you, you got the point that it's this. I left the trill out this time. As I mentioned before, after the opening motive, we have something that may appear as a counter subject if this were to be a fugal piece. For the last two eighth notes of this counter subject, which may be regarded as another example of a sighing motive, I would play the first note long, something that the ornament encourages us to do anyway, and the second note fairly short. The first note is also a non-chord tone, so that's another incentive to prolong it as much as possible, thus spicing up the harmony. Let me show you what I mean. Um, the notes that I have in mind are these. If I can play a little bit the beginning of the counter subject, and I'm going to leave out the trills for a moment. I'm talking about these in other words.
Uh, so I'm playing the first one long and then the second one short. And the ornament helps us do that anyway. One final aspect of interpretation I would like to mention, and this applies especially to pianists, and I'm saying this because I also came from the piano world, so to speak, has to do with tied notes. I don't want to generalize and present this as some sort of rule, especially because tied notes can appear in so many different contexts. But frequently, when you have tied notes like what you find in this invention, generally speaking, the tied note should be separated from the note that comes afterwards. For example, if we look at measure 7, we have three instances of this, two in the right hand and one in the left hand. And what we have here is this, I will play the right hand in it for a minute. Here's a tied note, the G, to a G 16th note on the first, um, the first note of the third beat. So, and then, and this note is tied to the next measure. And then we go on. So what I would say here is when you see something like this, oh, and the, the left hand has this. Here's a tied note. What happens is um, sometimes, especially when we play piano, we try to create a big musical line, a long musical line. So the tendency is to do something like this and just watch my fingers because um, another aspect that I'll mention in a minute is that the harpsichord with a faster decay almost gives us a hint that we can't really create this long line anyway. So, um, so this is the piano version, shall we say. And what I would do here is I would actually separate the tied note from what comes afterwards so that again we get these gestures. Here's one gesture, another one, and another one. So we have all of these little gestures this way. The same thing happens in the left hand. So instead of doing this, do this. Etc. Etc. So this is another example of the difference in performance practice between the 20th century, where we think of long lines and therefore we try to connect everything together into a long phrase, and performance practice in the Baroque era with the emphasis on short gestures. So the idea here is to articulate or enunciate, if you will, all of these individual gestures, otherwise we overlook their expressive content. As always, thank you for watching, and I know you've listened to it once already. I hope you enjoy the second time you listen to the piece, this time with the score.